Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you and welcome on Father Mitch Packwell and welcome to Threshold of Hope, our program where we bring you the writings of Pope John Paul the Great, now blessed John Paul the Great. Uh, before we get to the document, we want to remind you that you can send us emails by writing to threshold at EWTN.com. And the first email we have is this. Uh, matter of fact, a couple from some young people. Uh, Dear Father Mitch, in my religion class, we were learning about the end of the world. Many of my classmates were wondering if it would hurt or would it be instantaneous. Can you give me advice about what I can tell them? That's from Ryan. Well, Ryan... I'm afraid that the book of Revelation describes it as a time of great pain. And it's pain for, especially for those who don't believe. But even for believers, they'll be persecuted by the unbelievers. And there's, there are descriptions of terrible persecutions going on at the end. So it may well be very painful. Now for the unbelievers, it's going to be painful with no meaning and that they're going to be suffering all kinds of things, one thing after another. And that's a very strong part of the book of Revelation. In other books of the New Testament, it's described as a great tribulation. And that there, so it also describes it as a time of pain. So it's not something to look forward to. Now there is a, a very modern doctrine that was invented in the 1800s called the rapture, by which uh, it's believed that those who are believers will be snatched out of the pain. But that's not something that the Bible teaches. The Bible, you know, includes persecutions for those who are believers, and this is going to be part of the, the problem. So. The end time is not going to be a festival of joy. It's going to be a time like there's, a, there's an ancient Catholic hymn called the Dia Zire. Uh, and it's, and it, in English it goes, O day of wrath, O dreadful day, shall heaven and earth in ashes lay. You know, it, it doesn't, the, the, the Old Testament prophets and the New Testament don't portray it as a time of, of, of pleasant experiences. So I'm sorry to give you that advice, but this is one of the things that we do now is prepare ourselves always to be ready for when Christ comes, whether he comes to take me away as an individual, which is what it will be for most of us, I suspect, or whether it be the end of the world. And then another one from a young person, uh, Father Mitch Pacwa. I'm currently a freshman in high school. And I saw a painted picture in my art class that showed Jesus, John the Baptist, and an angel named Uriel seated together with Mary. Is there such an angel? I know archangels Gabriel, Michael, and Raphael, but I do not know an angel named Uriel. I've done a little online research, but you can't really trust what you read online. I was wondering what your thoughts were. If there is such an angel with such a name, and if we can pray to him like we pray to Archangel Michael, only with Uriel's expertise. A high school student ready to learn, Joanna. Joanna, I love it. The right attitude, ready to learn. I hope you keep the attitude of being ready to learn until the day you die. There's always more to learn. The older I get, the more I realize how little I know. And so there's lots more to learn, and I keep trying to learn stuff. So keep that up. Secondly, the name of the angel, Uriel, is found in the fourth book of Esdras, which is not part of the Bible. And he is listed as uh, one of the angels and named as such. And some Christians picked up that he was a fourth archangel based on that fourth Esdras. Okay? Now, when this was brought up to the Pope, uh, I don't remember which one. It might have been John the first, but I can't remember the top of my head. It was one of the ancient popes who said that you may not pray to Uriel like you do to the other archangels that we know from the Bible. So that was rejected. So don't, don't seek their intercession. He may well be a very good angel, 
but the, the popes have asked us not to pray to them. Stick with the ones we have in sacred scripture. Uh, the angels, according to the book of Revelation, in chapter 8, verse 3, take our prayers like incense and that they offer them on the altar of God. And so it's good to pray to the angels and seek their intercession, but uh, do so with the angels that we know or your own guardian angel. And that's enough help. All right. Let's now get to our document, which is known in Latin as Redem Taurus Missio. You can get a free electronic copy of Redem Taurus Missio by going to our website, which is www.ewtn.com. When you go to the uh, website, go to where it says live television shows, and then click that on, then click on Threshold of Hope. And when you click that on, we have this document linked at Threshold of Hope, or, and you can also see last week's show if you missed it. And you can also go to the part of EWTN's document library on encyclicals, and it'll be there as well. Radem Taurus Missio, or it means Mission of the Redeemer. Now we are on paragraph 20, which is entitled The Church at the Service of the Kingdom. It begins, the church is effectively and concretely at service of the kingdom. Now, the reason he's talking about this is, as I mentioned last week, there were a number of theologians who had, especially some of those who had politicized our theology. And these theologians talked about the kingdom of God as a political reality and that you should work for the kingdom. Because the, by the kingdom they meant those ways in which Christian values or gospel values affected our world. But they did not want to promote the church. Be, or, or for some of them, they did not even want to promote Jesus Christ, the Lord of the kingdom of God. So, you know, this is why he's bringing this up. And he says that the church is at the service of the kingdom of God. This is seen especially in her preaching. So the church should preach. See, one of the things going on is that some people say we should promote the kingdom of God and stop trying to evangelize. Let's not preach the gospel of Jesus. Let's not try to get people to convert to Christianity. We'll just preach the kingdom and gospel values without talking about converting to Jesus and his church. And the Pope is emphasizing that the church is at the service of the kingdom, especially in her preaching. So rather than neglect the preaching of the church, we want to highlight the preaching of the church. And the content of the church's preaching must be Jesus Christ. He's the one that we preach. And that's the task that we have at hand. Preaching constitutes the church's first and fundamental way of serving the coming of the kingdom in individuals and in human society. So the way we help individuals and human society is by preaching about Christ. That's how they come to know that they can go to heaven. That's how they can come to be free of fear of death. So this is a very important. Eschatological salvation begins even now in newness of life in Christ. Now, by eschatological, remember that word. He uses it a lot. It means studying the end times. The eschaton of the end times. So eschatological means referring to end time salvation. The ultimate salvation will be when we are counted by Christ as having our names written in the book of life and that we are among the saved and we are not going to hell. That is eschatological salvation, end time salvation. Okay? And here he cites 
John chapter 1, verse 12. But to all who received him, that is Jesus, who believed in his name of Jesus, he gave the power to become the children of God. That is key, is that we receive the power to become the children of God and not political advantages, even when they are good political advantages. There are some good things in politics. It doesn't mean that politics is evil. And I don't think politics is evil. It's something that must be done. But it is not salvation either. It is neither evil, nor is it our salvation. Salvation means being in heaven with God for all eternity. The church then serves the kingdom by establishing communities and founding new particular churches. This is one of the ways in which the church serves the kingdom, by building up the communities of the church. And then by guiding them to mature faith and charity, in openness to others, in service to individuals and society, and in understanding and esteem for human institutions. So that we want the new churches and the old communities to be at the service of humanity. This is a good thing. It's not bad. But we do so for the sake of salvation. The church serves the kingdom by spreading throughout the world the gospel values. Now these gospel values are an expression of the kingdom. And they help people to accept God's plan. So that there are values like loving your enemies. You know, I got one email recently, somebody, or not an email, it was an article that came in. And it was about somebody who had had a mass offered for Osama bin Laden. And some members of the parish were all upset. How, we can't pray for Osama bin Laden. Yes, we can. We're supposed to love our enemies. We didn't choose to make him our enemy. He chose to make himself our enemy. But that doesn't mean that we stop loving him and praying for his soul. And if the prayers are such that he cannot use them because he's not in purgatory or hell, or not in heaven or purgatory, but is in hell, then those prayers will go for somebody else. But Canon 901 in the, can, in the church's canon law allows us to pray for anyone dead at all. So that's one of the things that we can do. Well, that's a gospel value, to love our enemies. And that's one of the things that is an expression of the kingdom and which help people accept God's plan. And there are many other gospel values that we see in the, you know, the, the Beatitudes and in the parables and in the teachings of Christ. It is true that the inchoate reality of the kingdom can also be found beyond the confines of the church, among peoples everywhere. Now, what is inchoate reality? Inchoate means beginning and kind of formless. That's what inchoate means. It's just getting started. And it doesn't have real good shape. For instance, the United States was inchoate in 1775, it didn't really have shape. There was the Continental Congress, and then there were troubles. And then in 1776, the Declaration of Independence gave it more shape. But it, re it wasn't really until the Constitution was written later on that there, it got its shape. So it was in Kuwait before then. That's what he means by it. And Many gospel values have an inchoate shape among many peoples. There are many people who you know, have basic good values. There are, uh, for instance, Muslims are very good at giving alms to the poor. This is one part of their religion. That's one of the five pillars of their faith, to give alms to the poor. Now, when we see these 
value, these gospel values, though they might be in Kuwait, these are good things. And they're found among peoples everywhere. Buddhists have very wonderful values. And Hindus have very high values. Confucians and Taoists and many other people who practice religion have very high moral values. And we should respect those values. And we can you know, see that they live gospel values to the extent that they're open to the spirit who breathes when and where he will, as we see in John chapter 3, verse 8. Jesus said to Nicodemus, the wind blows where it wills, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know whence it comes or whither it goes. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. So that there might be ways in which the Holy Spirit is breathing on other people to give them these values, and that God is really working with them. But it must immediately be added that this temporal dimension of the kingdom, that is, this dimension of the kingdom that lives in time, that's what it means by temporal dimension of the kingdom, remains incomplete unless it is related to the kingdom of God, the kingdom of Christ present in the church and straining towards eschatological fullness. So that having these values is good, but they're still incomplete until you belong to the church, which is the body of Christ. We don't think of the church just in terms of the organization and the chancery office and the Vatican offices and so on. We think of the church as being the body of Christ that includes all that and all the members of the church. And that brings completion so that you belong to Christ and are in union with him through being a member of the church. And then also that you have eschatological fullness, that you know that history is moving toward the day in which Christ will come again. That he's going to come again to judge the living and the dead. And knowing that and preparing for it completes the faith and gives it structure. Just like the Constitution gave structure to an inchoate United States, so also fullness of faith gives structure to the inchoate ideas and faith and values that exist among many peoples. So that's one of the things that he does. And we, we can cite here in the footnote, Evangelii Nunciandi, which was by Pope Paul VI, in paragraph 34, where it says, when preaching liberation and associating herself with those who are working and suffering for it, the church is certainly not willing to restrict her mission only to the religious field and dissociate herself from man's temporal problems. Nevertheless, she reaffirms the primacy of her spiritual vocation and refuses to replace the proclamation of the kingdom by the proclamation of forms of human liberation. She even states that her contribution to liberation is incomplete if she neglects to proclaim salvation in Jesus Christ. So it's good for people to have liberation from oppression, from poverty, from sickness. And the church works in those areas. But it's not enough to, to, to do that. We also have to preach this is the way to get to heaven and to find eternal life. Jesus Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through him, as we read in John 14, 6. The many dimensions of the kingdom of God do not weaken the foundations and purposes of missionary activity. And he gives a footnote here from the International Theological Commission at the 20th anniversary of the closing of Vatican II in October 1985. And they said, to limit the church to her purely earthly and visible dimension is unthinkable. Such is the work that the Holy Spirit accomplishes by the power of the gospel, permitting the church to keep the freshness of youth. We can't, it, it sounds more practical 
to talk about the way that the church affects society. It sounds more practical to talk about the way that the church affects the poor. And that is good, practical behavior to do. But it's not the be-all and end-all. It's only a means. And we, have to, uh, and we have to be alert that the church must consider life after death as well. For one thing, it lasts longer than life in this world. So the dimensions of the kingdom of God do not weaken the foundations of missionary activity, but they strengthen and extend them. The church is the sacrament of salvation for all mankind. And her activity is not limited only to those who accept her message. She is a dynamic force in mankind's journey toward the eschatological kingdom. So for all of humanity who's going to the end times, the church is a force and she's a sign and a promoter of gospel values. Here he cites God in Mispez, the Constitution on the Church in the Modern World, paragraph 39, where it says we are taught that God is preparing a new dwelling place on a new earth. Therefore, while we are warned that it profits a man nothing if he gain the whole world and lose himself. This is right out of Vatican II. It profits you nothing to gain the whole world and lose yourself. The expectation of a new earth must not weaken, but rather stimulate our concern for cultivating this world. For here grows the body of a new human family, a body which is even now able to give some kind of foreshadowing of the new age. And it is no accident that the people of God who look forward to the second coming of Christ really spend their own lives building hospitals, orphanages, schools, and giving of themselves to others. Believing in the end time spurs us on to greater activity to help the world here and now. And we give ourselves because we know this world is not all there is. I cannot gather all kinds of stuff and take it with me. As I've said many times, there is no luggage rack on a hearse. You don't take it with you. And if you take it with you and tell them to put it in the grave, you can't use it. It just gets rotten. So we know that. And so we help this world all the more. The church contributes to mankind's pilgrimage of conversion to God's plan through her witness and through such activities as dialogue, human promotion, commitment to justice and peace, education, the care of the sick, aid to the poor, to children. In carrying on these activities, however, she never loses sight of the priority, the priority of the transcendent and spiritual realities, which are the premises of eschatological salvation. Salvation at the end of the world gives a priority to spiritual realities. So all these other things are good, but our priorities are on spiritual realities. Finally, the church serves the kingdom by her intercession. The church prays for the rest of the world. Every Mass is praying for the world. Since the kingdom, by its very nature, is God's gift and work, as we are reminded by the gospel parables and by the prayer which Jesus taught us, namely the Lord's Prayer, we pray, thy kingdom come. But we also pray for thy daily bread. We, we pray for both. We must ask for the kingdom. We must welcome it and make it grow within us. But we must also work together so that it will be welcomed and will grow among all people until the time when Christ, as it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, when Christ delivers the kingdom to God the Father and God will be everything to everyone. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 24, it says, Then comes the end, when he, Christ, delivers the kingdom to God the Father, after destroying every rule and every authority and power. When all things are subjected to him, 
then the Son himself will also be subjected to put all things under him, that God may be everything to everyone. So this is going to be the eschatological uh, help, or the eschatological hope that we have, and that we keep that perspective strong when we talk about the kingdom of God. And we keep that as our goal, and a goal for everybody to whom we preach. We want to preach to people to let them know they and we are all going to give an account to Jesus Christ himself for the way we live this life. And we want to let them know how to give a good account so that they can enjoy eternal life. That's going to be our focus. All right, we're going to take a break. We'll come back in a couple minutes and get questions from our audience and then start chapter three of this encyclical on the Holy Spirit. So please stay with us. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a nice group of folks from different parts of the country, and we'd love to have you come and join us as well. If you can make a pilgrimage here to EWTN, uh, please call our pilgrimage department at 205-271-2966. 205-271-2966, or go to our website, www.ewtn.com. And they'll help you with directions to get to Hansville to the Shrine of the Most Blessed Sacrament, as well as times for Masses here, uh, programs here, uh, tours of the network, and uh, anything else you need to know. Also want to remind you that I've got a brand new book, which is called How to Listen When God is Speaking. Uh, this is available from EWTN's Religious Catalog. And you can call Religious Catalog for that and any other products at 1-800-854-6316. 1-800-854-6316. Or go to our website, www.ewtnreligiouscatalog.com, and they'll get that sent off to you. All right? And also want to remind you that I'll be making a pilgrimage to France, to Catholic France, in October. And if you are able to come and join us, uh, it'll be October 3rd to the 14th. Uh, you can call 1-800-554-4556. 1-800-554-4556. Or go to the website, uh, my website, which is www.fathermitchpacwa.org. All right. So let's now go to some questions from our studio audience. Start off with this gentleman here. Sir, where are you from? From New Jersey, Father. Good. Why don't you hold that a little closer to your mouth? Sure. And um, uh, what's your question? Well, uh, one of the things that I was thinking of is that perhaps in our present day and age, we don't focus intently enough on the humanity of Christ. We mm -hmm. certainly accept his divinity and all that the church teaches about him. But really, to come to a true understanding, don't we really have to focus more intently on the humanity of Christ as it applies to us? As a matter of fact, I would put it this way. It's like two tracks for a railroad train. Both tracks have to be maintained in proper tension between them. So that if there's not the proper tension maintained between the two tracks, then the train will go off track and wreck. And we have to maintain this tension between the divinity and the humanity. We can't deny either side of it. And it's a matter of keeping both of them in balance. That is the way to orthodoxy. And throughout the history of the church, people have gone on one side or the other. 
And there's some places still where some people might focus so much on the uh, divinity of Christ that they omit talking about his humanity. But there are other people who so focus on the humanity of Christ that they omit the divinity. And neither one of those is good for our salvation. It's important to maintain the balance between both. Does that help? Let's go to another question. Ma'am, where are you from? Massachusetts, Boston good. area. Boston, good to have you here. <laughs> and what's your you. question? Um, it's somewhat like his. Um, did Jesus know what he was going to face during his passion, like from Gethsemane? Mm -hmm. um, did he know what he was going to be afflicted with? Yes. As a matter of fact, you see repeatedly in the Gospels, he predicts his suffering on the cross. So he knows ahead of time that he's going to be crucified and scourged and suffer on the cross. So, yeah, he, he was well aware of it. And that's where his, his divinity comes in, you know, and for the, to, to know the suffering of his humanity. So that's where the, the both are kept in balance. Now, you know, some, some people try to deny the humanity or say that Jesus was unaware of his human divinity, that he only knew that he was human, didn't know he was God. That's also a mistake. He's well aware of it and says so uh, in various places throughout the gospel. Beginning in uh, Luke chapter 2, when he goes to the temple, he's aware that he had to be about his father's house. So through his life, he's aware of his divinity and his humanity. And again, both of these must be maintained in, in balance. Okay? And then the train just keeps chugging along. <laughs> All right. We are ready now for chapter 3, which is called The Holy Spirit, the Principal Agent of Mission. So now he's going to change topics. We've been talking about the kingdom of God and mission. Now we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit and mission. And this begins with paragraph 21. At the climax of Jesus' messianic mission, the Holy Spirit becomes present in the Paschal mystery in all of his divine subjectivity. Now the Pope could have said that a lot more simply, but this is something that uh, he doesn't always do. Uh, and, I, and this is a quote, by the way, from his encyclical, uh, Dominum et Vivificantum. But before I go on with the quote, let me just explain that uh, sentence. So the Holy Spirit becomes present in the Paschal mystery. That is, in Jesus' suffering, death, and resurrection. That's the Paschal mystery. And, we, and, and then ascension. So the Holy Spirit becomes present in that. In all his divine subjectivity, the Holy Spirit is also God. And by divine subjectivity, it means that he is a divine person. He is a subject. See, this is a philosophical term. He is a subject who has freedom of will and personhood, knowledge, and all the other things of being a subject, just like each one of us is a subject with our own personality, so also the Holy Spirit becomes present in all of his divine subjectivity. Now he continues on with the quote, as the one who is now to continue the salvific work rooted in the sacrifice of the cross. So with Jesus started on the cross, the Holy Spirit is going to continue. Of course, Jesus entrusts this work to humanity, to the apostles and to the church. Nevertheless, in these men and through them, the Holy Spirit remains the transcendent principal agent of the accomplishment of this work in the human spirit and in the history of the world. The invisible and at the same time omnipresent paraclete the spirit who blows where he wills. So this is going to be, you know, very much um, his basic understanding of how the Holy Spirit continues to work in the church. Jesus 
went and saw the holy women, then the apostles, various disciples, and groups of disciples, and a number of, a number of apparitions that he had raised from the dead to talk to them. Right? So he, he does that. And he gives them the mission of preaching to the world. But they are not going to do it on their own. The Holy Spirit is going to be the one who works through them. And that's the point that the Pope wants to make here. That the Holy Spirit is working through them. He goes on in paragraph 21.2. The Holy Spirit is indeed the principal agent of the whole church's mission. More important than the apostles is the Holy Spirit. More important than the bishops, priests, deacons is the Holy Spirit. More important than the laity is the Holy Spirit. He's the principal agent. He's the main one acting in the church. And this is going to be a, a key principle for us to understand. Because if we are going to be on mission, then we must cooperate with the Holy Spirit. That's going to be the point that he wants to make. The Holy Spirit's action is preeminent in the mission agentes, that is, in the mission to the nations, as clearly can be seen in the early church. For instance, in the conversion of Cornelius in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 10, the whole of chapter 10, which I urge you to read, is about the conversion of Cornelius a Roman centurion who lived in the city of Caesarea Maritima. And an angel was sent to him to send messengers to get Peter. Peter came, began to preach, and then the Holy Spirit came upon Cornelius and his family and friends. And the first Gentiles were converted by this outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Also, the Holy Spirit is present in the decisions made about the emerging problems in the church. In Acts chapter 15, in Acts 15, there's a problem. Do the Gentiles have to follow Jewish law? Must the men be circumcised, and do they have to eat according to the kosher rules? Some of the early Christians, especially Christians who had been converted from the Pharisee party, wanted the Gentile Christians to submit to Jewish laws. St. Paul and St. Peter said it's not necessary. Those are part of the old covenant. We are now part of the new covenant. And so we don't need to go through those uh, Jewish cer uh, ceremonies. And the Holy Spirit, as it says in the letter at the, in Acts of the Apostles chapter 15, there's a letter that said that it seems good to us and to the Holy Spirit that you don't have to do these things. Also, the Holy Spirit was active in the choice of regions and peoples to be evangelized. In Acts of the Apostles, chapter 16, verse 6, it says that they, St. Paul and his companions, went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. So the Holy Spirit forbade them to speak in Asia Minor, but then through a dream opened up Macedonia. And they went and started the church in Europe. So that was the first uh, preaching in Europe. The Spirit worked through the apostles, but at the same time, he was also at work in those who heard them. And so we see in Again, in Dominum et Vivificantum, the encyclical on the Holy Spirit, paragraph 64. In this way, the Holy Spirit is another counselor or a new counselor because through his action, the good news takes shape in human minds and hearts and extends through history. In all this, it is the Holy Spirit who gives life. And you see, a number of times in Acts of the Apostles, that as the Apostles are preaching, like Philip the deacon, 
the Holy Spirit, you know, comes to the people of Samaria after Peter and John lay hands on them, they receive the Holy Spirit. Before Peter lays hands or baptizes Cornelius, he receives the Holy Spirit. So that the Holy Spirit is acting in the people to whom the apostles are preaching. And we need to remember that. Because when we are preaching and teaching, then we must trust that the Holy Spirit is going to be acting in those people to whom we're talking. And we should be praying for them to be open to the action of the Holy Spirit. And not just my words, but the work of the Holy Spirit in their hearts, because that's where conversion is going on. Conversion is up to God. It's His grace that does it. That's why I say conversion is a management question. I'm in sales. I can explain the reasons to believe, but I can't convert anybody. Neither can you. None of us convert anybody. The Holy Spirit does the converting. We just give the reasons to believe. And that's a good thing to do. But that's how he's working through us. Now, paragraph 22. Sent forth to the end of the earth. All the evangelists, when they describe the meeting of the risen Jesus Christ with his apostles, conclude with a missionary mandate. So every gospel has a mandate from the risen Lord Jesus to go and preach the gospel. Christ never neglects in his appearances to tell the apostles and disciples to go out and preach. One of the key passages is Matthew chapter 28, beginning with verse 18 through 20. Learn this passage. Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always to the close of the age. Now this is very important. And you see in the other Gospels, we're going to take a look at some more of these in just a few as we go through this, that this is Jesus sending them forth in the Spirit, as is clearly apparent in the Gospel of John. In John chapter 20, verses 21 to 23, he says, Peace be with you. Then he breathes on them and says, Receive the Holy Spirit. As the Father sent me, so I send you. Now that's the words of Christ, to commission them. But it's a word that applies to us. He wants to commission us with the same Holy Spirit so that we can go out and we can evangelize by the power of the same Holy Spirit. Christ sends his own into the world just as the Father sent him. Remember what he said. As the Father sent me, so I send you, receive the Holy Spirit. God the Father sent Jesus at the baptism in the Jordan with the power of the Holy Spirit, so he sends us with the power of the Holy Spirit. This is what it means for the Father to send us as he sent Jesus. And to this end, he gives them the Holy Spirit. St. Luke, for his part, closely links the apostles, that the links the witness the apostles are to give to Christ with the working of the Holy Spirit. And that, that's why Jesus said, you will be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. That's in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 1. And go back to Jerusalem, and the Father will endow you with the gift of the Holy Spirit. And, that he, and the Holy Spirit will enable them to fulfill the mandate they have received. They could not do this mandate without the Holy Spirit's help. They need his gift. So do we. Now, paragraph 23. The different versions of the missionary mandate 
contain common elements. So there's certain things in common to all of these commissions by Jesus. And there are characteristics proper to each. Now, there are two elements found in them all. All right? We want to talk about the common things and the distinctive things. Two things are common to them all. First, there is the universal dimension of the task of entrusted to the apostles, and that's a very important thing. And uh, so it's a universal. It's not just to the Jewish people. It's not just to the people of the Mediterranean world. It's not just to the people of Europe or the people of Asia, but it's to everybody. In Matthew 28, verse 19, Jesus said, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. All nations. Nobody is accepted. Then we see in uh, Mark chapter 16, verse 15, Jesus said, Go into the world and preach the gospel to the whole creation. So everybody is included. And then in Luke 24, verse 47, he, Jesus said, Repentance and forgiveness of sins should be preached in his name to all nations. You see how you, this is a regular fig, uh, feature, that Christ wants everybody to be saved. And then in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus said, You shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, Samaria and to the end of the earth. So there is no stopping us. We must go to all the different places. So that's the first uh, common element, that it's a universal mission, and we are not to leave some people alone as if, well, you know, these are cute pagans, and we want to preserve them like a museum piece. Anthropologists might want to study their paganism, so leave them alone. Don't preach to them. No, we are to preach to everybody. Secondly, there is an assurance given to the apostles by the Lord that they will not be alone in the task, but they will receive the strength and the means necessary to carry out their mission. So they're not doing it on their own power. God is helping them. And the reference here is to the presence and power of the Spirit and the help of Jesus himself. So that as we see in Mark chapter 16, verse 20, they went forth and preached everywhere while the Lord worked with them and confirmed the message by the signs that attended it. So that this means that the Holy Spirit and the Lord Jesus are working with us. Jesus said in Matthew 28, and behold, I am with you to the end of the age. He promises he sent in, in Acts chapter 1 that he sent in the, to receive the Holy Spirit that the Father will give them. Over and over again, he promises them help. They will receive that gift. Now, those two things are in common to all the commissions. Universal and that God will be giving help by the power of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. Now there's some elements that are distinctive to each gospel. So let's take a look at the distinctive things. Different emphases that the gospels have within themselves. For instance, Mark presents mission as a proclamation or kerygma. Kerygma is the Greek word for proclamation. And you see in Mark 16 verse 15, go into the world and preach the gospel to the whole creation. So he focuses on preaching the gospel. And his aim is to lead his readers to make the profession of faith that St. Peter made in Mark chapter 8, verse 29, when Jesus asked, but who do you say that I am? Jesus wants to ask every person, St. Mark has a sense that every human being must answer that question, who do you say Jesus is? And Peter answered him, you are the Christ. That's the answer the Gospel of Mark wants to evoke from the world, that Jesus is the Christ. 
And also, to say with the Roman centurion who stood at the cross in Mark chapter 15, verse 39, when the Roman centurion saw, stood facing him and saw that he breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was the Son of God. So that Peter, the Jewish man, said that this is the Christ. And the pagan Roman centurion, the Gentile, said, truly, this is the Son of God. And this is what St. Mark wants to evoke from his readers, to get them to make a commitment to Jesus by this preaching of the gospel. In St. Matthew, the missionary emphasis is a little different. It's placed on the foundation of the church and on her teaching. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always to the close of the age. According to him, the mandate shows that the proclamation of the gospel must be completed by specific ecclesial, that is church, and sacramental catechesis, that they, the, the gospel of St. Matthew gives us this teaching of Jesus. And you must teach everybody else what Jesus taught the apostles. And you must give them the sacramental completion by baptizing them. So, so while St. Mark doesn't mention baptism, St. Matthew does. And then in Acts of the Apostles, he doesn't tell the apostles to baptize, but they do it anyway. In Luke, mission is presented as witness. Especially in Luke chapter 24, verse 48, you are witnesses of these things. That's the way he wants it. And the word for witness is martyr. Martyron. Martyrus, excuse me. Um, and to be these witnesses is exactly what we are called to do. And that's what Jesus is asking, especially centering on the resurrection. In Acts of the Apostles, chapter 1, verse 21 through 22, it says, So one of the men who had accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day he was taken up from us, one of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. So that when they choose an apostle, Matthias, to replace Judas Iscariot, he is called to be a witness to the resurrection of Jesus. So that's the emphasis. Now, none of these is wrong. We have to learn from all of these gospel testimonies so that we too are going to proclaim the message that Jesus is the Christ and truly the Son of God, as in Mark. We're going to proclaim baptism in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching all that Jesus taught, as in Matthew. And we're going to be witnesses to the resurrection of Jesus, as Luke says. All of this is going to be part of what we do. John, on the other hand, oh, excuse me, I almost skipped a part. The missionary is invited to believe in the transforming power of the gospel and to proclaim what Luke presents so well. That is, conversion to God's love and mercy. That's one of the things that St. Luke wants us to understand. Conversion to God's love and mercy. And the experience of a complete liberation, which goes to the root of all evil, namely sin. And that Christ's gospel is going to go to the very root of sin itself and change people's lives so that they stop their sinning behavior. They change their way of acting. And they start to imitate Jesus Christ. This is going to be the task of the gospel. And that's going to be Luke's emphasis. So, we won't have time to go into what John said, but for us to take time to reflect on how I am to pick up these various aspects of the gospel, to preach to all men and to trust in the Holy Spirit, to be a witness and to proclaim the message. 
This is the task we do in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you.